Hello. <coughs> We're letting them in. Yeah, I've just clicked on it all. So, there's a better turn my camera on. I know I look like if I don't look good at this lights in the kitchen against a green background. I look quite orange. I'm not trying to be <laughs> Bob, uh, Bob Trump or Donald Trump or whatever his name is, but I will <laughs> share my video. If I can work out how to do it, start video. <laughs> So there we are. As you can see, I do look quite orange against uh, against the green background. <laughs> so good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Stuart Jones. I'm the chair for the West Midlands or West District of the IOSH West Midlands uh, branch. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we've got a guy called Lance Jackson who's going to talk to us about confined spaces. Uh, so um, I've not got much more to say about that, but um, I'll back in at the end and say thank you and we'll open it to questions uh, so I'll hand over to Lance thank you well thank you very much Stuart well uh, good evening everyone thank you for turning up um, just a very short potted history of my uh, working life uh, I spent 30 years working for well originally the West Shropshire Water Board and then Seven Trent Water uh, and then um, 25 years ago or something like that now I managed to escape from there and I've been freelance health and safety consultant ever since uh, specialising in confined spaces uh, training and risk assessments and so on uh, but uh, again as a result of that I've uh, branched out into various other things um, working breathing apparatus uh, for emergency first aid uh, and things like that as well uh, but uh, still my my main one is confined spaces obviously coming from the water industry there's a lot of confined spaces um and so uh, that's just to uh, explain to you why it's me that sat here today and um I'll now Sorry, Lance, I accidentally muted you. <laughs> yeah. That's my, my fault. Well, it, it may well be, of course, that's the best thing to do with me is to mute me and then uh, you can have half an hour sleep without me disturbing you. Um, yes, as I was saying, um, that's my background and, and now I, uh, I'm going to uh, um, share my screen with you, I hope. Uh, where is it? Uh, So, uh, can you all see that? Not yet. Do you want to try that again? Um, let's get the share screen button and then the PowerPoint window should be one of the options. Right. I don't know what's happened here. Let me try. Uh, yeah. So, share screen. Now it's come up this time, yeah. Uh, uh, right. That's the one. And there we are. How are we doing now? Can everyone see that? Yeah, there we go. Lovely. Well, um, obviously, this is the first question we have to ask ourselves. What is a confined space? Uh, any ideas, anybody? So, total silence. Well, um, I, I was going to have a go. It's, it's space. It, it, it's a space with restricted access and egress, where there might be an influx of something that might cause sort of uh, oxygen deficiencies or over oxygenation or um, some sort of a silo where you might get grain engulfment that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's a that's pretty probably... good. Sorry, Bob. Sorry, um, Stuart. Carry on. Yes, I, th I think that's a, a pretty good um, description that it's a place which is substantially enclosed. Uh, it doesn't have to be totally enclosed. So it may be a deep trench 
uh, to get down to a, a burst uh, sewer or something like that. It could be an open top tank, could be a manhole, uh, could be a, a silo, all sorts of different things. But the fact is that it's substantially enclosed is the main thing. And as, you, as you, um, Stuart also said, um, it's going to be limited access and egress as well. So it could be that there's only one entry and exit point. It could be that, that exit points off at the side of a silo or a vessel up a vertical ladder through a small opening. And of course, the sort of thing we have to think about as well is uh, how easy would it be to get a badly injured person out of there or, or to get a, um, an unconscious person out. It's not just an able-bodied person we have to think about, you know, we have to think about the worst scenario when we're talking about the, uh, the rescue plan as well, which uh, um, you know, we'll do come on to it later. So a place which is substantially enclosed uh, and uh, where there's a reasonably foreseeable risk of serious injury due either to hazardous substances, as Stuart mentioned, uh, gases, liquids, vapours, dust, etc. Uh, and what, what I say to people really, it, it's not, if you think of the confined space itself, um, the only thing that varies between industries really is what's in it. You know, the space itself could be, uh, as an example, I've been to many sites where um, there are silos. Uh, sometimes those silos contain stone, sometimes they uh, contain uh, grain, sometimes they contain uh, chemicals for, for treatment, uh, uh, lime or something like that in a silo, you know. So lots of different things, and but the hazards nevertheless remain the same, uh, whatever the industry really. So, uh, you know, we can narrow it down quite well. And, and really, I think this description, the, the fact that it's substantially enclosed and there's something in there that could cause harm is the, the basis of it all. And really that statement gives us a clue as to how we can actually control the hazard. So if we can remove the um, enclosed nature, for instance, by removing solid covers, by opening up uh, manhole covers and vents and so on, and maximizing the ventilation, or we get rid of the thing that was going to cause harm by purging, by ventilating, by uh, washing out, by you know, physically removing the substance that was in there. Uh, then again, we may be able to reduce the uh, level of risk, or it could be even that we could uh, um, deregulate it altogether and say that it's, now we've done that, we've got rid of one of those two things, even uh, as a temporary thing, under perhaps under a permit to work, that we can say, right, it's no longer a confined space for the purposes of this job, because we've got rid of the hazard. Um, I, I was asked by Shropshire Council a long time ago now to go to a job at Coalport Bridge, some of you will know where I'm talking about, um, the old bridge just down by the um, uh, the pub in um, right down uh, in in the the, the Coalport Dale, um, and um, what they were doing, they were underpinning the buttresses of the bridge because it was uh, showing signs of age, just like me really, and. Um, uh, they were concerned for two things, but one that they actually got to using a mini digger under the bridge and they were concerned about the exhaust fumes and so on. And when I got there, they'd actually come up with quite a novel way of dealing with that. And they got a hose clamped on the exhaust of the mini digger and they'd taken it up onto the deck of the bridge. Uh, and so the, as the mini digger moved up and down, it was actually taking exhaust away, which, uh, uh, although it was a bit Heath Robinson worked very well. But the, their main concern was that um, as they dug down uh, under the bridge, they found a pipe, um, 300 mil pipe, which they didn't know it wasn't on any of the plans. They hadn't got a clue what would be in it. Uh, and because it was a, it's a very old bridge, they were really concerned about uh, what they might find in there and if there was dangerous atmospheres there that uh, uh, it, it could obviously uh, harm people. Uh, and I went out to have a look at it for them. And because of the, where it actually was, um, I was able to suggest to them that they battered the sides of the trench back to open it up wider, open to the atmosphere. 
Uh, and basically, they, by the time they'd finished doing that, they'd virtually exposed the pipe completely. And then they were able to break into it safely, knowing that there was uh, sufficient ventilation to take away whatever was likely to be in there. As it turned out, it just it turned out to be a solid lump of sludge, which had probably been there for years and years. But that's just a, an example of what I'm talking about. Obvious examples, chambers, tanks, vats, pits, pipes, flues, uh, all the sort of places that uh, uh, you know we come across on our everyday sites. Um, and uh, you know really, um, the, the, the things that we're so familiar with that sometimes we can actually uh, forget the fact that they could be dangerous. And I think that's one of the biggest issues with confined spaces is that people just don't recognize the danger that they could be faced with. Uh, the number of people who died in confined spaces um, simply because, uh, you know, they've not recognized the danger. And then the number of people who've also died as a result of um, seeing their colleagues in trouble and going in to help um, really are still now are averaging about 10 people a year uh, dying in, in confined spaces somewhere in the UK. Uh, the hazards we're talking about, uh, again, as Stuart uh, mentioned earlier, it could be uh, you know, injury from fire or explosion. It could be from dangerous fumes or lack of oxygen. Um, my experience of oxygen is the biggest one of all because it can happen through so many different ways, of course, through simple, you know, very small space, a simple act of breathing is sufficient to reduce oxygen levels uh, to, you know, to a point where it's noticeable anyway, uh, but obviously rushing organic matter, um, any aerobic process uses up oxygen. Rusting metal, metal uses up oxygen as part of the process. Um, it's so many different things that can actually use up oxygen, but it's probably the biggest single problem. Too much oxygen is also a problem uh, in certain cases. Uh, for instance, uh, welding inside a vessel or a tank or even inside a ship, it's been uh, serious accidents have happened where people have uh, left the torches and hoses under the deck overnight and uh, um, gases have leaked out and then the following morning they lit the torch and uh, uh, resulting in an explosion which killed a number of people and so on. So uh, too much oxygen can also be an issue. And drowning, uh, drowning in liquids, um, particularly when I first left school, I went to work on a farm for a year or so. And uh, about 15 years ago now, the farmer I uh, worked for actually um, was helping his son try to clear the blockage on the pipeline between the milking power and the slurry tank. He went off to the slurry tank and he'd been gone some time. His son got worried about him, went to look for him and found him dead, floating face down in the slurry, overcome by the gases coming from it. And uh, I've been running these, uh, you know, combined space courses and um, combined space risk assessment for so many years. Uh, the, the, the trouble is it's almost become a, a sort of fairy tale to me, you know, but when somebody you know actually dies in that sort of environment, it makes you realize it happens to real people, happens to everyday people. And um, <laughs> the asphyxiation by a free-flowing solid, uh, again, an agricultural example there, but uh, very distant relatives from the partners, they're uh, um, farmers, and the mum and dad went out for the day, two days before Christmas. When they got back, they found the son's Land Rover standing on the yard with the engine running, couldn't find the son, and eventually the dad climbed up the ladder on the grain silo, found the hatch was open on the top, shone his torch inside and saw his son engulfed in the grain. And of course, when grain goes in a silo, it starts to gently ferment. And as it ferments, it produces carbon dioxide, which being heavy in there, displaces the oxygen even more. Uh, and uh, so more than likely you get partway down the ladder. And of course, uh, people think, oh, well, I can hold my breath. But it doesn't work like that. It's virtually instantaneous. A lung full of an inert gas uh, would cause someone to fall directly off the ladder. And even if he was still breathing, he, he would be engulfed in the grain and that would stop him breathing completely in a matter of moments. 
and high temperatures can be an issue as well. And of course, we're all very familiar over the last 20 months or so with temperatures, body's normal core temperature between 36 and 38 degrees centigrade. Um, and um, once your body's temperature exceeds 40 degrees centigrade, you start losing control of your faculties and you can very quickly collapse and die. So high temperatures can be a major issue in confined spaces. I, I went to a factory in um, uh, Starbridge where they powder coat the parts, for, or they make uh, wheelchairs and they powder coat all the parts for them. And um, they've got this uh, bake oven where the um, parts go, go through to powder, you know, as part of the powder coating process. And um, they were having regular problems with the um, conveyor line jamming. Uh, but of course, they've got temp high temperatures inside the bake oven. But to cool it down sufficient to go in uh, without any protection would take uh, 24 hours or more. So uh, what they were doing, they were actually uh, wearing special suits with big thick boots on the soles and they were breathing apparatus inside and they were going in to um, clear the blockage, which would take them a few minutes like that. But uh, I was actually training them at that point to actually use working breathing apparatus and the special suits and so on, so they could do the job, you know. So high temperatures can certainly be an issue. Um, so I'm not going to preach to the converted. You, I'm sure you're all very well aware already. Um, that obviously, the Health and Safety at Work Act requires employers to provide um, a safe system of work, a safe place of work, and provide training. An awful lot of people I deal with, with on, when it comes to confined spaces and confined space training uh, are contractors working for other people. And um, what I do find is that uh, an awful lot of employers, even some of the good ones as well, um, fail to recognise uh, their responsibilities uh, uh, under Section 3, certainly, to ensure that uh, um, uh, your people other than their own employees are protected. So, um, you know, all too often I hear stories uh, of uh, the fact that the contractors themselves have been left to their own devices and, uh, um, and you know, the, the client has not taken on their responsibility to ensure that the site is safe uh, by trying to engineer problems out or things like that. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's quite worrying that. And, and one of the other things I quite regularly told as well by the contractors that uh, when they arrive on site, the, the client lends them their gas monitor um, to actually go into a confined space, uh, which is uh, really fraught with problems because uh, who's to say that, that gas monitor is in good working order and properly calibrated? Uh, so I always say to contractors that they should really think about hiring their own to be certain. So obviously, duty section seven, we all know about the duties uh, of employees as well. Take reasonable care of themselves whilst at work and cooperate with their employer in terms of health and safety. And then the management rates again, we all recognise the requirement for risk assessment. So I'm not going to spend time going through that. Um, COSH very much comes into it, obviously, because uh, when we're talking about confined spaces, a huge percentage of the issues involved in confined spaces are um, come under the COSH regulations, you know, whether it's substances or dust or whatever the case may be. And of course, uh, also under this uh, heading comes, uh, uh, you know, the diseases, no, we all know zoonoses, which are obviously uh, diseases which can be passed from animals to man, the main one being um, leptospirosis or Biles disease carried by rats in their urine. But uh, it's again, surprises me how few um, contractors, certainly when I'm dealing with those, and in fact, how few employers really, recognise that uh, they need to do a risk assessment on those under the cost regulations. And similarly with the, you know, dried pigeon droppings and things like that all come into the picture. So, uh, and of course, occasionally, well, I have quite a bit to do with agriculture as well. And, uh, um, you know, a lot of, uh, in terms of agriculture, there are a lot of um, transmittable diseases such as orphan anthrax and all sorts of other things, which, uh, 
um, employers don't seem to recognise uh, zoonoses. And then PPE, I do spend quite a bit of time talking about PPE because, you know, again, it's a big focus the last 20 months or so, but uh, obviously in health and safety, we've been um, um, talking about PPE for years and the fact that employers need to ensure that uh, they provide suitable and sufficient PPE uh, and that employees should use it and use it properly, obviously. Um, and I mean, one of the things that I'm dealing with with confined spaces all the while is harnesses. And um, I just ran a course on Tuesday with the, um, one of the lads on the course um, was actually too big to get into the harness, uh, into the standard harness that, that uh, uh, his employer had given him. Um, and so I had to say to him, well, you need to go back to your employer uh, and ensure that he buys the correct harness for you. Uh, a, that's large enough for you, and B, that's uh, um, safe, uh, the safe working load, because um, the one he'd been given was for 100 kilos, and I, I guess I would have suggested he was heavier than 100 kilos, uh, which means that he needed the operated harness, which most of those are 136 kilos. Um, and so it's obviously got to be the right harness for the job as well. Again, people come uh, with the wrong type of harnesses, steel erection harnesses or abseiling harnesses and so on, uh, whereas it should be um, obviously a three-point harness with the, an upper attachment point for confined place rescue. Uh, obviously, rescue being a continuous load. Whereas the deering in between the, the shoulder blades or the deering on the the, the, the sternal attachment uh, designed for work at height, which is and fall rest, which is a shock load. So, um, you, you know, the number of people, even big companies, who've got the wrong harnesses in, in terms of that is is quite uh, concerning. And uh, then poor again, you know, I just point out the fact that. Uh, um, you know, the, whatever the equipment we use in the workplace has to be suitable for purpose. Gas monitor has to be have the right, you know, people think, oh, I've got a gas monitor protected against all um, issues. In fact, they're not, you know, and the, the standard gas monitor these days usually covers oxygen, hydrogen sulfide, methane, uh, and carbon monoxide. Those are the standard gases. Uh, so, you know, people are naively think they're protected when they're not. And then the confined spaces regulations themselves, obviously, um, to, um, superseded the section um, 30 of the, uh, sorry, of the Factories Act um, and obviously brought it up to date because uh, um, the Factories Act was written in absolute terms, of course. And um, that made it a bit ridiculous at times. Um, and uh, of course, the other problem was that the Factories Act only applied to a fairly narrow section of the working population, whereas these regulations apply to virtually everyone at work, the only exceptions really being deep sea diving and mining, because they have their own legislation, obviously, and uh, a vessel at sea because it comes under maritime law. But when it comes back into port, of course, the ship's holds comes under the regulations and of course they're notoriously dangerous places where many people have died over the years. So it came into effect 28th of January 1998. Uh, I still keep uh, talking about the new regulations but they're not so new anymore. Uh, 23, year old, 23 years old now, coming on for 24 years so uh, um, it just shows the time flies when you're enjoying yourself. Um, so the main requirements, obviously, as with all modern health and safety legislation, there's that hierarchy. Um, avoid the hazard altogether where we can do. And of course, these days, uh, a lot of businesses are set up to do that. Companies like Dynarod, you know, I, I think of the days um, in, in my youth when I was working on farms and I was down a manhole with a set of drain rods and pushing and shoving and there'd be a load of black foul smelling guns coming down the pipe, uh, bringing dangerous gases with it. You know, nowadays, of course, it's all done from the surface instead. 
and the same with the cameras to inspect uh, drains and the like as well, you know. So just a couple of examples there. Uh, but where it's not possible to avoid entry, and uh, in reality, of course, that's often going to be the case, uh, then as, as you're all very well aware, I'm sure, um, the employer needs to carry out a risk assessment with the, uh, the aim of, uh, we can't remove the hazard altogether, so the, the aim of actually producing a safe system of work, uh, which may, of course, also include a permit to work. Um, and, and that's part of the process. And of course, part of that will uh, in itself include proper arrangements for emergencies, uh, uh, which may include a rescue plan and so on as well. And of course, the other thing we have to consider here, as I sort of mentioned it briefly right at the beginning, um, an awful lot of confined spaces are accessed by our vertical ladders. Uh, and so when it comes, a lot of people when they talk about work at height, tend to think about that we're going up, but of course, just as many confined spaces are underground, and so it's going down as well. And in fact, it can uh, compound the issue when you're going down a manhole, because four, seven metres off the roof onto the ground, getting to you is going to be com comparatively easy. Four, seven metres down a manhole and getting you out is going to be an awful lot more difficult. So. That also has to be all considered as part of the arrangement and part of the risk assessment as well. So consider a proper arrangement for emergency. So, so looking at each of those in turn, I am instantly going through this very quickly, but yeah, as you probably uh, well aware, you do have the uh, um, potential here as Stuart's put on there to post any questions um, if you have any at the end so that uh, we can talk about them then. Um, just gonna, uh, so the, the, just looking at the avoid the need to enter. So it says quite plainly in the regulations that no person at work shall enter a confined space to carry out work for any purpose if it can be done without going in. Um, and, you know, it's quite plain and simple that, that uh, um, you know, it's a legal requirement to do that. And obviously, um, as I often say to people, when it comes to risk assessments, so, Sometimes it's just as important to uh, record the, the fact that you've thought about an issue, but you can't avoid it because it's all very well saying to the inspector when he walks in, oh, yes, I thought about that. But unless you've recorded it in writing somewhere, um, you know, is he likely to believe you? That's the thing. Um, so uh, this in itself requires a risk assessment. Um, Valve spindles, uh, um, I think, I don't think it's uh, wrong for me to mention that uh, um, a bloke died at a sewage works, a large sewage works um, in the northeast of the country, shall we say. Um, he actually, uh, what happened was two men would go on site every morning in a van. They would do various jobs, which are classed as two man jobs, before the one bloke gets back in his van and goes off around the little roll of sewage works leaving the other bloke on the main site to do various one-man jobs during the day. Mid-afternoon, he'd come back from his round. They'd finish off any two-man jobs before going home. On this particular day, he came back from his round, couldn't find his mate, searched for him for some time before he found him dead in the bottom of a tank. It was a three-metre-high raised tank, vertical ladder on the outside, big sign at the bottom saying confined space, two-man entry only. Both the lads had worked for the company for uh, numerous years, and both of them had been trained and had refresher training in entering confined spaces. In fact, when they found the bloke, he obviously realized it was dangerous because he'd got a gas monitor hanging on one of the step arms, still beeping away, saying the atmosphere was unsafe. And um, I mean, I'm sure nobody sets out for work in the morning with the intention of harming themselves. And I think he thought he was being helpful, saving a bit of time. And we think what happened was that there must have been a blockage in one of the pipelines feeding into this chamber. And the bloke had decided to go in and open up a valve and see if he could clear the blockage. And when he did so, um, a, some sludge came down the pipe, brought a plug of gas in front of it, which expanded rapidly, overcame him. It collapsed in a heap 
and quite literally drowned in the rising sludge. Not that there's a nice way to die, but that must be a particularly unpleasant way to go. Now, when the case got to the coroner's court, that bloke's family had to sit and hear the coroner rule that in effect that man had committed suicide by ignoring a safe system of work that was in place. The water company wasn't criticised at all for actually, uh, for the training or anything. But the one thing they were severely criticised for, and that's really why I'm mentioning this now, is that uh, if they, when they built the chamber, if they put extension spindles on the valve wheels to bring the valve wheels up to the top of the tank, the bloke could have operated the valve from the top without going in, and he probably would have been, still been alive today. And at the time they built the chamber, it would have cost £100 per valve to put extension spindles on. So for the sake of £300, the bloke lost his life. Very dramatic illustration of how we can sometimes avoid entry. High pressure hosing, again, we used to send drain the big tanks down on sewage works, um, send a bloke in with a bucket on the end of a rope and a shovel, and he'd start shoveling the sludge into the bucket for his mate to haul up and chuck in the dumper truck. And you can imagine as soon as he started paddling around the sludge, he'd release trapped gases, which would set the alarm off, and you'd have to come scuttling out again. Nowadays, you use a four inch high pressure fire hose, they wash the sludge away down the drain. That has the added benefit is as it goes down the drain, it draws fresh air into the chamber uh, and um, uh, improves the atmosphere even more, you know, so uh, high pressure hosing could be another issue. Improve natural ventilation, you know, this is very important. Having said that, the problem in natural ventilation is you can't guarantee it and it can go from safe to unsafe quite quickly. So sometimes forced air ventilation is a better option. And the, the, the big advantage of using forced air ventilation is that if, if you know the capacity of the air mover and you know the capacity of the confined space, uh, then you can work out the flow rates and the, uh, should aim for um, five full air changes per hour to get to and at that sort of level, you, you'd actually feel the air moving, um, which is um, you know, a bit positive then. Uh, I, at uh, Raider in Mid Wales is the Elam Valley Reservoir, which supplies water to the city of Birmingham down a seven mile long, brick, a seven, 70 mile brick, long brick built tunnel. Wonderful piece of Victorian engineering work. And once a year, they shut sections of it down to inspect it. And I've been through two sections with them. And um, the, the, it's huge, big enough to drive a transit van through, certainly. And um, a normal practice, as many of you will know, when you're going into any tunnel or drainage system, where you can do is to open up the access hatch you're going in and at least one upstream and downstream from where you're working. And um, obviously that creates a flow of air because warm air rises. Uh, and when, when you go through there, they always carry a special um, chemical oxygen escape set with them because the standard escape set normally only lasts for 10 minutes and obviously it'd be a mile and a half into a tunnel system that's not going to be any good so they carry special chemical oxygen escape set to, which will last up to 100 minutes uh, and they carry a gas monitor with them but in all the years they've been doing it they've never had the gas alarm go off because the air movement in, in there is that strong that you're literally leaning into the wind and your hair and your clothes are flapping around in the breeze um oh i'm not sure what's going on there oh remotely operated devices um uh, again in mid wales at uh, planet lois is cloedog reservoir uh just down the road from stewart uh there and um uh, the, the built in the early 1960s when it was built it was actually the biggest concrete structure in europe and um like many um, of these structures, it's not totally waterproof. There's always some seepage of water on the bedrock it's actually built on. And what they've got there is six six metre deep manholes right down the bowels of the dam with a V notch in the bottom of each one, um, which measures how much water is actually passing through the dam. And what used to happen was that um, once a month, two blokes would go down with all the kick, tripods, winches, harnesses, lines, set it up over the first manhole. Bloke would go down six metres, read the V-notch back up, pack it up onto the next one. Time-consuming, dangerous operation job that no one enjoyed doing. Uh, so they fitted remote reading devices on the V-notches. And nowadays, uh, 
bloke in the office presses a button whenever he needs a reading and uh, they go down just once a year to recalibrate the V-notches. So they've removed 11 out of 12 needs to enter a confined space, which is obviously the aim of the whole thing to avoid entry wherever possible. Um, but the, one of them is a particularly nasty one. They, they got a, it was a curving tunnel and they got this go-kart with wheels set on an angle for the, for the shape of the tunnel. And they used to strap up somebody on its head first with a cap lamp on. And it's got two motors, two cables on this thing, and they'd lower it down. They invited me to have a go, and I politely declined. I don't mind confined spaces, but that one was taking it a little bit too far. Um, sewage works not far from where I live. The blokes used to scramble down onto the weirs. I mean, it's same blokes. I'm not being sexist. It, it was in those days. There's lots of ladies now. Um, but um, they scrambled down onto the weirs on the circular sedimentation tanks to sweep the sludge off them. Uh, and they were obviously in danger from slipping and falling into the effluent, in danger from the gases building up in there. Simply by buying longer handled brushes, which cost about three pounds extra at the time, they could sweep the weirs from outside the handrails without going in. So a very simple solution to avoid entry. Better lighting went to a factory in Wolverhampton where they run a 24 hour operation, three eight hour shifts, four times a shift, so 12 times a day. They were going into a three meter deep manhole to read a flow gauge. I said to them, couldn't they pipe the flow gauge up to the surface to avoid entry? But they said for hydraulic reasons, they couldn't do that. But instead what they did was they altered the angle of it so it could see it better from the top. They put a positional flood, uh, floodlight just outside the confined space because there was a potential for flammable gases in there. Uh, and nowadays, um, you know, the bloke just reads it from the top, turns the floodlight on, reads it from the top without going in. And design it out again. I'm sure you're all with me on this one. Uh, the Health and Safety Act, uh, Work Act obviously says that everything designed for work has to have safety built into it. Uh, provision and use of work equipment reg regulation. So one particular sewage works at one bourne. A uh, bloke was scrambling down a seven metre deep ladder once a week with a grease gun to grease a, a pump. Um, we piped the grease nipples up to the surface so it could do it from the top without going in. And CDM, uh, as I point out to people, does not mean Cadbury's Dairy Milk, although it's a nice, tasty option. Uh, construction design and management regulations, of course. Um, and of course, since the, uh, um, the 2015 update, uh, the designer has been made responsible for the safety of his design. So um, an awful lot of things we see in the workplace uh, as a result, in my opinion, of poor design, I've come across several where uh, a little bit more thought could have made things a lot easier. And I, I think the designer should be thinking about the people who are actually going to, well, to start with construct, uh, construct this uh, thing, which of course, obviously the CDM regulations largely look at that, but then they should also be looking at the people who are going to operate it throughout its life, the people who are going to maintain it throughout its life. And then of course, the people at the end of its life are going to demolish it to make sure there's no confined space hazards there as well. So where we can't avoid entry, uh, the next thing, of course, before sending anybody in, is to carry out a risk assessment. Um, first, we've got to think about who could be affected. And, uh, and obviously, we have to think quite widely with uh, things, particularly with things like uh, explosions and dust clouds and so on. Um, you know, probably one of the world's, world's worst industrial accidents, Chernobyl, affected people literally thousands of miles away from where it happened. Uh, the sheep in the forest of Dean glowed in the dark for several years after Chernobyl. Um, and uh, I'm not trying to put any of you off, but if you drive up uh, the M5 past Frankly services or further down past Strentham services, uh, there's 25 tonnes of liquid chlorine stored uh, um, behind those places. We, you know, if that got out, it would uh, kill every passing motorist, every bit of wildlife and vegetation for miles around. And same going up the M1, uh, where the A M50, so the A50 crosses the... Uh, between Derby and Nottingham, there's Church Will Water Treatment Works with again with a, a large quantity of chlorine stored there. So, you know, we do have to think very widely about who could be affected. 
uh, and obviously um, what is the risk to those people. Um, we have to make sure that we have a competent assessor and this is a, something that it, I, it, it's not the, really the client in this case, I think it's very often the contractors because a lot of these contractors uh, I come across certainly are, are quite small businesses really and um, you know, I'm, again, I'm not being um, uh, sexist or anything like that, but when you ask them who does their risk assessments, they are, the answer quite often is the girl in the office. Uh, well, with all due respect to her or him, whichever it is, um, you know, do they actually understand the issues relating to confined spaces? So um, anybody who does confined space risk assessments, obviously, um, it needs to have the, the knowledge and skill to be able to do that. So, the, I mean, obviously, competency is all about that plus experience. Um, and, um, you know, that's what, what I find so often that uh, the people who are doing the risk assessments don't actually uh, have the experience to do it. Uh, and I would say, again, that the best risk assessments are the ones that involve the people who are actually going to do the work. Not necessarily that they do the risk assessment, but they... Obviously, they should be doing a dynamic risk assessment when they're actually on site, but uh, they certainly should be involved in the initial risk assessment to ensure that the, the hazards, I mean, people think, say, oh, yes, it's when it comes to, as an example, work at height, it's very obvious to anybody that uh, uh, the, the, the main hazard is falling off the ladder. Um, but when it comes to going in a hole in the ground, uh, not everybody recognises that there is a danger attached to it. Um, so, the, you know, the, any person who's getting involved in the risk assessments need to understand the work environment. And they can obviously then develop generic assessments. So I, I know, uh, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, people are dead against generic assessments these days, but uh, in my opinion, they're still very good as a starting point because an awful lot of the work we do in the workplace is repetitive. Uh, and that's where really the, um, the dynamic risk assessment comes in, obviously, because that converts a generic assessment to an, into a job and site specific one. So uh, obviously, Again, it's very important that the people who do that have got that knowledge of confined spaces. Um, I'm just a good example, um, hydrogen sulfide, which comes from rotting organic matter. Uh, I ask this every time, and I ask this on, even on re refresher courses as well, which uh, uh, instantly have to be done every three years. And um, I ask people what, what, what the hazards are relating to hydrogen sulfide, and uh, it's surprising how few people actually remember. And, and I hope I'm not teaching uh, uh, converted already, but uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide in lower concentration smells like rotten eggs or stink bombs, such sort a of smell. Um, and as it gets up to about 10 parts per million, which is when the gas alarm would go off. Uh, what happens is it, it paralyzes the nerves in your nose, so you can't smell it anymore. And so uh, people could be forgiven for assuming it's gone, whereas in reality it hasn't gone at all. And of course, uh, uh, it can eventually um, paralyze your lungs completely and kill you. So, uh, you know, it, it, if the person doing the risk assessments doesn't recognize things like that, um, I mean, some hazards are say, are very obvious, but some are not so obvious, and you have, have to have somebody has to tell you about them before you know about them. So, the generic assessments are say good as a starting point. Then we have to think about the condition of the confined space, the history, or what do we know about it? Uh, what was in the vessel previously, for instance? Um, uh, you know that that's obviously very important. And, and uh, are there any residues left behind as well? Um, two brokes died in a disused sewer on the Camden town about 25 years ago. Uh, the whole area was derelict and there were plans in place to build a new industrial estate there. Uh, and this little civil engineering company was given the job of going out to survey the old sewer to see if we can be recommissioned. And they arrived on site, lifted the manhole cover, um, put the gas monitor in and it said it was safe. So they then made two fatal mistakes. The first one being um, that the uh, first bloke went in without the gas monitor, assuming it was going to remain safe. 
uh, and then the second one was that uh, once he collapsed, uh, the top man saw what had happened and without telling anyone, went in to try and help uh, and he collapsed as well. And uh, this was about half past nine in the morning because uh, a lot of gas monitors have data loggers in them and this showed when it had happened. And then um, uh, six o'clock in the evening, one of the boat's wives rang up and said, where's my husband? He's not come home. Boss went out to look for him and found them both dead in the sewer. Now, whilst you've got to really criticise the uh, um, company's poor communication system and loan working and so on, well, it wasn't loan working, but, uh, you know, communication with them, um, it, it all boiled down in the end to the fact that uh, uh, the first bloke went in without the gas monitor, uh, which obviously you should never do. Um, contamination, uh, very big, just, just as I moved into health and safety in 1985, 86, something like that, um, the, there was, there'd been a, a major issue uh, just a year or so before that, uh, at a place called Abbey Stead in Lancashire, contractors building a big impounding reservoir for Northwest Water, as they were then, not United Utilities nowadays, um, and uh, uh, there'd been a lot of local opposition to this uh, th development, but eventually it all went ahead. So when it was all finished, they decided to hold a civic reception in the pumping station one night, and they invited the mayor, the parish council, everyone else along to see what had been done. And during the evening, there was a huge explosion, which killed quite a number of people and seriously injured a number of others. It took them quite some time to work out exactly what had happened, but eventually they realised that when they built the tunnel, they must have opened up a crack or a fissure deep into the earth, down to rotting forests literally millions of years old, producing, amongst other things, methane. Methane being lighted in the air and highly explosive, found its way up through the fissure, was carried by water down to the pumping station, and either the pump starting up or someone lighting a cigarette, causing a huge explosion which killed all those people. And obviously nowadays, um, um, developers have to consider that and uh, you know whether that could happen again before it happened it was it was safe enough to argue it couldn't happen but of course once it happened uh, that was no longer safe um, and the consulting engineers on, in that job I think were binnies and they were you know very very sensitive about that obviously Auction deficiency or enrichments, I've talked about uh, already really, but uh, there's so many ways that auction deficiency can develop. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, it's very, very common indeed. Uh, so, and um, again, a lot of people don't appreciate this. And I mentioned about auction enrichment as well. Uh, physical dimensions, uh, I mean, uh, a number of things here. A lot of the manholes still to this day are, um, you know, the standards were set directly after the Second World War, where people were uh, um, uh, quite a lot slimmer than uh, these days. Um, obviously, they'd been on comparatively meagre diets as well, so uh, uh, obesity wasn't really much of an issue in those days, but human beings are getting bigger anyway. So now we're getting examples of people getting stuck in manholes and so on. Um, I, I've been I used to do a lot of work down in London at the Skills Training Centre down in London, and uh, um, a number of occasions where I've had to reject a, a delegate on a course because they were uh, too big to actually get through the uh, training module that we got there. So um, you know that has to be considered. And, and uh, another one is a tripod, a standard tripod and winch. Um, is designed for a maximum safe working load of 136 kilos. So again, employers need to consider whether in fact uh, that's going to be sufficient for some of the people uh, within the workforce. And cleaning chemicals, um, obviously uh, the big issue there is um, uh, the potential uh, for, for mixing these, you know, on the cocktail effect of mixing different substances together. Um, Shrewsbury Abattoir, or, you know, I live in Shropshire, and Shrewsbury Abattoir, a good few years ago now, they built an extension on it, and um, not long after the new part had been opened, uh, they were clearing down one day, cleaning down, washing down, and uh, um, a lad in, in the old part of the uh, um, abattoir uh, collapsed, and it, it was eventually discovered that they were, they were, the cleaning chemicals they were using 
um, in the new part of it, and the cleaning chemicals they were using in the old part were, were incompatible with each other, reacted when they met each other in the drains, uh, backed up the one drain and overcame this lad. And, uh, you know, obviously that sort of thing has happened on many occasions over the years. So cleaning chemicals obviously can be an issue. I'm aiming to finish about half past seven, incidentally. Um, so I'm, I'm just rabbiting on and uh, no one said a word. So uh, uh, I hope you're all, uh, I can see there's a few people still here anyway with us. Sources of ignition, obviously, where there is a potential for flammable gases, we need to consider very carefully about sources of ignition. Uh, I did five courses for BP at Fursley Island in the middle of Pearl Harbor. The only way out to the island is on, on BP's own ferry. When you arrive on site, you have to hand in your mobile phone, your radio page, your remote control key fob for the car, or your um, you know boots have got can't have steel toe cap steel studs, um, no nylon clothing. All your tools have got to be intrinsically safe. Obviously, it's part proof. Um, because uh, obviously, I mean, we used to do uh, work around um, gas holders on sewage works. Uh, and again, we had zoned areas for that. So it's important to think about where there is a potential for that. It has to be included in the risk assessment. And ingress of substances, any chance of solids coming pouring in, any chance of liquids coming pouring in, which could uh, um, um, injure people as well. Uh, one of my clients is... Um, uh, there was surface dressing and tarmacking and a bit of civil engineering as well. And they were working up in uh, um, Carnarvon, actually. They were um, working on a chamber uh, just on the side, of, anyone who knows Carnarvon, very close to the castle, they were just on the side of the river. And um, they were working in there. The job was actually for the county council. And... Um, one of the, the lads, been, they've been there a while, and one of the lads just sort of remarked idly, really, uh, I'm sure that water in the bottom of the chamber is coming up. And um, a little bit later, he looked again, he said, yeah, it's coming up, I'm sure. And it turned out that uh, the chamber was tidal, but uh, the, the client hadn't actually told the, the subcontracts about that hazard. So uh, obviously that would uh, be an unpleasant experience as well. So the final slide anyway, um, arrangements for emergencies. And as I said earlier on, this is obviously part of the risk assessment and it may indicate the need for special arrangements for emergency rescue. Uh, I mean, which may be no more than somebody wearing a harness attached to a winch rope or it could be like the lads I was training at Fursey Island, where they couldn't rely on the land-based services. I was training the, uh, their team in the use of working breathing apparatus, oxygen resuscitation, because when you've got a big air on, you can't actually do mouth-to-mouth -mouth on someone. Uh, so you train them in the use of special stretches where you can strap people in and winch them up vertically. Um, so appropriate rescue and resuscitation equipment. Uh, let, raising alarm and rescue. Um, there's two issues here, really. One is how are they going to communicate from within the confined space? I remember uh, running a course for a contractor in Telford who unfortunately doesn't uh, exist anymore. And um, they, uh, I said to their supervisors um, that uh, they were all going to go to do a job, actually, on a, a bridge over the River Seven that just outside the... Um, Gloucester, uh, Maysmore, and over uh, River Seven, and um, they, uh, I did this training course for the supervisors before the job started, and then uh, a week or two later, they asked me to go down to Maysmore to train some of the uh, um, uh, the lads who were working there. And I arrived on site, and the a supervisor came up to me and he said, "Look, what I've got intrinsically safe radio. Hired them in specially for the job, so." Uh, but what they were doing, they were cutting out uh, uh, entrances through the buttresses of the bridge and they were going from one to another, um, working in there. And so we climbed into the first one. Um, the, some, somebody squeezed the trigger on the radio and the gas alarm went off. So we had to come scuttling out again, uh, reset the thing back in again. Same thing happened again. 
And what we found was that the radio waves were bouncing around in the reinforced concrete, uh, interfering with the gas marshal and setting it off. So they had to go back to square one and rethink uh, how they could do it. So, you know, having a means of raising the alarm from within the confined space, whether it's just an aerosol hooter or whatever it is, obviously it's very important that that has to actually work in the environment that it's going to be used in. And then, of course, the other issue is how you're going to call for help externally. Um, and again, um, you know, a, a lot of the contractors are certainly say, well, you know, the client will do this. Well, as I say to them, you, you know, the very least you've got to do is make sure that you've got proper contact and communication with the client right throughout, because it's no good uh, uh, taking five minutes or more to actually get someone um, of the client staff before they can actually call for help. And of course, also very important that uh, uh, the, the security staff or the gate staff or whatever are told as well, so they um, can ensure that when the emergency services arrive, that they're, they're met with somebody who can provide them with plans on the site and also to guide them through to where they should be to um, do whatever's necessary. But of course, uh, again, I'm sure it doesn't need um, uh, any, me to tell any of you, but um, I remember when I first moved into health and safety, um, you know, if you'd ask somebody then what would you do in the case of a, uh, an incident in a confined space, their response would have been called for the emergency services. Uh, but the emergency services have made it quite plain these days that obviously the person who creates the hazard or, or uh, uh, creates the environment where, where the hazard exists uh, has a duty to manage it. So, of course, uh, uh, whilst you're still going to call the emergency services, they're going to be there to back the, con the client up or the contractor up rather than uh, just perform a rescue themselves. So, um, you know, people, clients and uh, contractors and so on need to understand their responsibilities in, in terms of that. A safeguard in the rescue is unfortunately the history books are full of evidence that more people who die in confined spaces were potentially rescuers than the actual victim themselves. In Kent, three people died. Um, the, um, the building new industrial estate had been a very wet summer and they were having problems with the surface water drains backing up. Hadn't even been commissioned at this point and they were backing up. Young lad had left school in May, couldn't get himself a job and his uncle got him a job on this construction site in August. Started work on the Monday morning. Tuesday morning, um, supervisor took him out with him to help him lift the covers on one of the manholes so the supervisor could go in to find out what was going on. So they lifted the cover, supervisor started going down the ladder with no kit whatsoever. Halfway down the ladder he fell off and landed face first in the water in the bottom. Young lad must have remembered seeing a rope in the pickup, ran back and grabbed it. Uh, he started to go down the ladder obviously intending to tie it round the rope to see if we could get him out. Halfway down the ladder, he fell off as well. Lad's uncle heard the commotion going on, ran across to see what was happening, saw his nephew in a heap in the bottom and understandably went in to try and help. And all three blokes died in probably less time than it took me to, to tell you the story. Uh, and the cause there, quite simply, as I said, it was in Kent. Predominant soil type in many parts of Kent is chalk. Rainwater running through chalk reacts with it and produces carbon dioxide which being heavy in air displaces oxygen, coupled with the fact that because of the very poor uh, weather at the time, the low barometric pressure forced even more uh, carbon dioxide down into the manhole. So, um, you know, it was as simple as that. And HSC was so concerned about it at the time uh, that they commissioned a video to be made of it or based on it called Watch That Space, which is our standard training video for many years. More recently, there was a um, contractor building a big impounding reservoir for Seven Trent, my ex-employers, um, at a place called Carsington in Derbyshire. And there was a very experienced bloke, there was four blokes actually working away from the main part of the site. And very experienced bloke, uh, been in the industry for many years, went, went down a seven metre deep ladder and collapsed at the bottom. In turn, three of his mates followed him in and the last bloke in was the last bloke on that part of the site. No one had called for help. Um, 
two hours later, a delivery driver arrived on site. He'd been told to be set, someone there to um, accept the delivery. Couldn't find anyone and had to wander around. Eventually uh, spotted these blokes collapsed at the bottom and had the common sense to call for expert help. And I reckon if they called for expert help immediately, there was a slight chance they could have got those two blokes out alive, as it was the uh, three blokes. I mean, sorry, four blokes. Sorry. No, start again. The first bloke out alive, as it was, they all just lay there for two hours before they were found. Um, fire safety. Uh, obviously, um, you know, we need to think very carefully when it comes to fire. If there's a potential for fire in a confined space, employers have to think uh, carefully about what type of firefighting media they uh, select, because uh, particularly carbon dioxide extinguisher uh, works by displacing oxygen. And of course, if you happen to be in the hole as well, or the place where it's discharged, it'll kill you as well. Uh, dry powder has the same uh, effect uh, and so on, you know. So. Uh, employers have to think carefully. Now, obviously, there are a lot of new types of firefighting media which are much safer. So part of the risk assessment needs to consider the appropriate type of firefighting equipment when necessary. Control of plant, obviously, what we don't want is automatic equipment to start up without warning. Uh, so proper lock-up procedures and everything. And yet I've heard people or stories of people saying, uh, yes, but this was an emergency, so we didn't have time to lock off. Well, in fact, that's the highest risk time of all. So uh, really, you know, they're very important that people follow the correct uh, lock-up procedures uh, and so on. So, first aid, obviously, again, employers need to have the appropriate first aid arrangements on site, uh, readily available as well. It's no good saying it as often I find out uh, that, well, we, we know we wouldn't, we wouldn't have our own first aider, but we'd use the client's staff. Um, well, are they close at hand? Well, well uh, no, but we'd have to radio for them. Well, you know, that may not be any good when you consider that uh, permanent brain damage can occur within three to four minutes. So through lack of oxygen, it's important that where people are entering confined spaces, that they have first aiders readily available. And public emergency services, again, as, as many of you will be fully aware, the management regs say that where necessary, um, uh, people need to, uh, clients and so on, need to talk to the emergency services in advance. Uh, we had um, a major job going on on a water treatment plant uh, at um, uh, Tewkesbury, uh, the Mythe at Tewkesbury, and uh, because uh, um, Tewkesbury is a Georgian town and the planning legislation is quite strict. This pumping station had a mock front on it, made it look like a Georgian building. And we got a two year contract going on down there. And um, we knew that the contractors were going to have to access a small quadrangle in between the, the mock front and the actual building uh, periodically. And we were concerned about how they would get somebody out if there was an issue. So we held a meeting with the emergency services, came up with a plan following week we, we put it into practice it didn't all go quite as we'd hoped so we had to tweak it a little bit but at least we knew then that uh, uh, the emergency services knew what they were coming to because whilst they're all very skilled uh, in what they're doing in reality of course um, normally the first they see of the scene of an accident is when they receive that emergency call so having the opportunity to call advance and have a look at it is all, all more, that more important and training for all those involved, obviously, an awful lot of what slide is over and above the normal sort of run of the mill. So, um, uh, you know, people need to ha have the appropriate training where, where necessary. So I, I, I could go on. In fact, I do go on uh, for ages, but I'm going to uh, call an end to it there and um, uh, hand it over to everybody else and see if there's any questions. I'd just like to say thank you, Lance. That was interesting, informative, quite scary. When you talk about so many, uh, so many incidents that happen almost by accident, really, and through lack of awareness. So, stuff like this is is really important. So, um, we've just got one question that's come in, and that is around uh, how can oxygen enrichment happen in confined spaces? 
it's, it's mainly really to do with the use of actually setting the equipment and that sort of thing where you actually introduce a, a source of oxygen, um, either actually settling for welding or that sort of thing, or uh, the other one, of course, is um, oxygen resuscitation equipment because obviously, you know, if you're taking oxygen resuscitator into a confined space, you're taking a source of 100% uh, um, pure oxygen into there. Uh, which is going, and, and as, as many people will know, when you get oxygen levels above 25% in the air, you get spontaneous combustion. Um, so it's very important that uh, we don't take that. And of course, with, with welding, the normal process is to have a source of oxygen outside the confined space, and that it's only the hoses and the torch that are taken in. And at the end of every shift, they should be removed from the confined space. And the one I mentioned on the ship uh, happened because they left the torch and the hoses under the deck overnight and there was a leak on the pipework and uh, um, it caused the explosion, you know, so that, that's... Yeah, I, I, I vaguely remember that from my Nebos days used as yes. a case example for the very same thing. It's, like you say, it's that in a confined space, the, the oxygen was leaking and then as soon as the guys sort of went to strike up again the, the following morning, bang. So, yeah, thank you. Pleasure. Has anybody else got any, anything to ask? There's a couple of comments, so uh, I'd just like to say, uh, um, very interesting. Thank you, Lance. Thank you very much, Lance. Uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, many thanks, Lance. Great presentation. So, um, thank you very much. Is there anybody else that's got any questions? So I will just bid you good evening. Thank you very much for attendance. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and keep an eye out for the next uh, next session that we've got planned for uh, January. Bob, can you just remind me what that is? Is that, I can't remember what we, in the diary. Can we, anybody remember what we, we talked Bob, about? Bob, we just put it in, Bob, did the, the one you published this morning, Bob, wasn't it? Yes, bear with me, I'm just, uh... Sorry for putting you on the, on, the, on, on the spot, Bob. While you find that, I'll just sort of say... It. I was just uh, going to have a good Christmas, everyone, if we, while, we, while we've got a gap. I, I, I was just going to say exactly the same, Lance, so thank Sorry, you very Bob. much. Have a, have a cracking well, Christmas, you can wish, you stroke can holiday wish period, whatever yeah. your um, plans are for celebrating or just chilling and relaxing. Do yours, what is a, you, you oh, do. yours is a Welsh greeting, obviously, Stuart. Mine's an English one. <laughs> well, yeah, we've we got to be uh, bilingual, as they say. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just uh, enjoy the holiday period, rest, recuperate, and hopefully uh, you'll join us again in the new year when we've got a presentation on. Here's your moment, Bob. Thank you very much. It is on... Oh, company. <laughs> you <laughs> love it. Tempor temporary works it's on the 30th oh, of january brilliant so that, that's around um and that's particularly interesting for me at the moment and uh, possibly one of my colleagues on the call as well because we are looking at temporary works in, in our organization at the moment as something that can be really high risk but is potentially not given the 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 kudos and the the attention that it potentially needs so uh, so look out for the invite uh, please register beforehand. And if there's no more questions, I would like just to say again, thank you very much, Lance. Very Bye. informative, very interesting, and very scary in the same in the same uh, same sort of thing. And yeah, thanks, Stu, Nadolly, Clowen, uh, to everybody, and have a happy Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Or a happy holidays, depending on whether you celebrate Christmas or not. So thank you very much. Bye. For your help. <laughs>